Well, uh, that was uh, quite an interesting month for me because uh, I was doing quite a lot of things, uh, working uh, on the new compositions, arrangements, and so on. How it is in Canada and how was it affecting your life? Well, <laughs> actually, my life is not affected that much um, because I don't, I mean, all I do is teach, so now I'm teaching online, and online is not as easy as teaching uh, in person, but, uh, but it's still fun. Um, I'm having more time to practice, which is sort of nice because I have to give a live stream recital in July, which I'll do for... Um, Young Artist Harp seminar because um, they they had to close down, so I said I'd do my recital anyway, and uh, so I have to practice. But now I have more time to practice, so hopefully the recital will be perfect. <laughs> and I'm learning some new things uh, because I have time to learn new pieces, and um, I, I'm uh, doing Zoom with my family. I'm actually seeing more of my daughter in New York than I have seen ever in my whole life because I see her every week and and ordinarily I just go and see her maybe two or three times a year and she comes once a year so that's that's really good um, and, so. and what what are the difficulties um, with the Skype lessons and uh, what is I've discovered zoom I, I, I actually used to refuse to do Skype lessons and Facebook because of all of the um, the, the sorts of things that I'm sure you've experienced too, that people will be playing and then suddenly the music will go on, but sort of stuttering. And they're sitting here like this and not doing anything. And then they catch up and there there's, or there'll be a sudden noise and then you can't hear anything. I mean, all sorts of things. And I gave up, I thought it's just not worth it and it's not doing them or me any good. But with Zoom, I've been able to go in. It's not really. Zoom is not programmed for music. It's only for the human voice. So there are some things in Zoom hmm. that uh, that you have to shut off. You have to uh, shut off, for instance, uh, suppress background noises and suppress intermittent noises because the minute somebody would change a pedal or something, then suddenly I wouldn't hear anything for a few minutes. You know, it was it was doing some really weird things. But by going into the adjustments and turning them off, disabling those things, I actually mm. am having quite a good experience now, especially if the student who is working with me has a microphone. And that is, you know, if they have a mic other than just their... Um, their computer mic or their their uh, cam their phone mic they have something else and it doesn't have to be expensive but it just uh going away from the phone or the computer mic and using your own separate one really makes a difference how is your experience with with this whole thing well i'm still uh you see i'm making um, experiments with different platforms like this particular one i like because it's recording everything in hd and then i can um, i can download it and work with that because zoom mm -hmm. recording is very bad quality even the stream is sometimes is better but uh with the students i think that if if there will be enough students i will I will find some kind of online uh, uh, teaching platform which has a really good uh, good stream and also adjustments for the sound because the same the same mm -hmm. thing Skype Skype always trying to uh, put all the sounds down and if I speak I cannot hear what they play and um, it's also a little bit delay so you cannot even you know count the rhythm because they get it uh, later I mean it's it's quite difficult but in the same time I uh, um, have the feeling that I'm much more concentrated I relay more on the uh, knowledge and uh, uh basic things then on the intuition because i know that when uh, when i'm in the same room with the student it's more like you you hear something and you try to explain that you feel something here is more about to concentrate on the technical things on uh, the way to 
achieve the sound, which, well, you can imagine that it will be a better sound, but sometimes Skype just doesn't give it. The students that you've heard live, it's much easier to teach them online because you sort of have a memory of, well, you do have a memory of how, how they actually play and uh, how they experience different emotions and different, you know, their phrasing and everything. You know what they would be doing if you were hearing them live. I wanted to speak about the time which we didn't have any Skype, Zoom or even the phone or laptop. Uh, I wanted to speak uh, with you about uh, Salcedo, Carol Salcedo and uh, that time mm -hmm. uh, about the, uh, the harp colony, about the harp ensemble and basically your experience uh, with him. Okay. You know, that's a long time ago. <laughs> well, I, I can say that it's 47, yes? 1947 you started? Um, let me see. I was 13, no, 12 when I first played for him. And I was 13 by the time I had my first lesson with him. So um, he came to my town and uh, he played a concert. And uh, so my mother, who was very up on things, she, I had been studying with a, a nun in South Bend, Indiana, in say at St. Mary's College, which is a part of Notre Dame, which is a very famous university in the States. And so I'd been studying with this nun who was a, basically a piano player, a piano teacher, but she had had a few harp lessons and that was, that was who I had studied with. And um, so uh, my mother wanted me to be heard by Salzedo. And uh, so he was giving a concert and she asked him to stay for a, a party after his concert. And then uh, if I could have a lesson with him the next morning before he left. And he said, yes. And uh, so he came and he gave a wonderful recital I, I know it was so inspiring and then he my he had, my mother had asked him what he would like to eat after the concert and he said bacon and eggs and beer <laughs> so she got all of that stuff for him and you know this is this is the first time i ever saw him the first i ever even knew about him and he actually put on a whole recital at my house improvising and playing different things and just, you know, he, he was very, very inspiring. Yes, yeah, so he played for the audience and I remember myself because I had been sent to bed, <laughs> but I, I, where we, where I was, there was a, the living room and then the a hallway and then the staircase going upstairs. And so I sat at the top of the stair and listened uh, for the evening. And then I had a, re a lesson with him the next day and he liked my playing and so he said well i'd like to have her as a student student and so at that point my my parents uh, arranged to get me a uh, they had an aunt take me the next summer to uh, camden maine and that's where i started my studies with him how tough oh, it was. he expected a lot <laughs> i would leave many lessons in tears because he started me uh, he, I was pretty advanced when I had played for him. I played things like the Debussy dances, and I think I did the Defia um, uh, Spanish dance number one. And, and you know, my technique was good. I, I was, you know, uh, technically avail ready. So he had me started on his etudes, which are quite difficult, you know, flight and mirage and... 
uh, in quietude, and and I didn't understand any of them. <laughs> I, I just didn't really think that I wanted to play them. So I would not really practice on those things, and I just was having a good time. And I went into lessons just having sort of read through them, and mm -hmm. then I would end my lessons in tears. But uh, it it got better. By the next summer, I was ready to work, and I went every summer until I went to Curtis from that time. Um, and in, in Curtis, everything uh, doubled. I mean, uh, what what is the educational process? I mean, uh, is there a mm -hmm. lot of pieces to learn and uh, how fast you should learn and how much to perform? Nothing, nothing like the French way that the teachers insisted you learn and memorize everything in a week and start on with something else. He was, if you remember, he had started his whole many years ago he had started his whole technique and he was very very um interested in in making sure that your technique was just right and he uh everything was slow and uh very very uh <laughs> boxed in i could say um everything had to be done just his way however as his student i already had quite a fast good technique um even sound by the time i was 12 when i played for him and he was not that insistent on many of the things that i've seen other players um uh exhibit in w what his technique was really like he he was very much with he in, even in his book he says that the bottom arm has to be level with the floor which means that your elbow is up this high when you're playing, which puts your wrist in quite a bit of uh, of a curve here, which is not very good for your arm. So if you release the arm a little bit, that's much better. And a lot of his students suffered from this business of having the arms just like this. And the sound was a little bit brittle and... Uh, I, I, they, they were always tight. So, um, but he never insisted on that with me. So I don't know whether it was something that I know one teacher told me that he had them do that because they, they had problems with keeping their fingers curved and this made them keep their fingers curved. I don't know if that was, uh, his way of doing things that, that he maybe did it with some of his students and not with others. But I see all different kinds of players who have studied the Salzedo technique. And most of them don't do what I saw him teaching many of the students to do. So. And what is with this um, holding the hands in the air? So he, in, he insisted that you didn't touch the soundboard. However, I remember one thing we were doing and i can't remember what it was he said no i have a little secret for you in this one you are allowed to touch the soundboard so i don't he would break his rules all the time and if you look at pictures of salzedo playing he did not have that technique he did not have he did not play like this if you look at just him sitting at the harp he was much more relaxed than what he was teaching. I have the feeling that uh, uh, the pictures of uh, Granjani, Hasselmanns, or Pierre Jamais, they are almost in the same position, I mean, as, as I feel from those pictures. So I, mm -hmm. I never... Let me see. Salzedo studied with Hasselmanns. Um, uh, didn't Renier study also Hasselmanns? No, I I think not. No, that's a little bit different line. Well, who did she study with then? Oh, that's good Am question. I Am I getting it mixed up? Uh, me too. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> mm. uh, all right. I thought she studied with Hasselmanns. Uh, I, I, I think. Uh, um, now I know Granjani studied with Renier. I know, he was studying with Hasselmanns, yes. I just checked, yes. 
What? Yeah, she was also studying with Hasselmans, yes. Okay. Okay, so I think there's I think Hasselmans was the line for a lot of the players. And um it was sort of he was the grandfather uh, of many of these teachers. That that's my supposition. Well, about the schools, I mean the um, a lot of harpists, a lot of uh, harp professors wrote the schools. It's not always the same way like they played. Like in the case of Salcedo, he was playing different way, but he wrote the school. Uh, and uh, it's uh, how how you think the people should work with the schools, or it's it's just for the teachers and the students shouldn't touch that themselves in not to be dis uh, disorientated. Well, I the only thing I can do is go back to when I first started teaching. Because when I first started teaching, I was very, very serious about carrying forth the tradition of how I knew that Salzedo taught. But it only took me a couple of years to realize that I didn't really play that way. And I thought the only thing I can do is because I know I have a, a very solid technique. I know that I'm doing all the right things. I'm bringing my fingers in. I'm relaxed. I'm all of the things that I do that make things work for me. Those are the things I have to teach. So I really stopped um, very soon into my teaching. I mean, I started when I was 22, when when I was first in the Toronto Symphony, and people would come to me for lessons, and uh, it didn't take me very long to get out of trying to just teach everything exactly the way I the, the way I knew Salzedo did because I studied with him and to go back to what I actually did and um, that was the real beginning of my teaching and um, I think I think you do the same thing I think I, I see you're writing a whole a whole method book you're going to do a whole method book i'm sure that you are going to incorporate the things that work for you into that method book and um and since we all know all of these great teachers and we know how well they can play it'd be good to to get viewpoints from all of them and some of them will even <laughs> some of them will even conflict with each other but everybody's hands are different what will work for my hands might not work for your hands or vice versa. Um, also, we just need reminders of things that are, are, are uh, absolutely, um, well, that have to be done. For instance, uh, I think once I asked you, how do you do those chords so fast in Petrushka? And you said, I keep my shoulders down. And you know, <laughs> do you remember saying that? Yeah. yeah. So, and it works. I mean, I can't play Petrushka's chords as fast as you do, but in fact, I I can't play Petrushka. But <laughs> anyway, I don't have your music for it. If you ever, if you ever uh, put it down on paper, I'd love to see it and just try it for the heck of it. But uh, anyway, you were right in other things, uh, things that had caused me stress. I checked out my shoulders, and sure enough. As experienced as I am, sometimes my shoulders go up, so I had to catch that. So, I mean, these are the things that as a teacher we have to be very, very sure about watching with our students. And um, and also, the, just the very fact that one teacher, it could all be things that we've all learned, but one teacher will be really good at reminding people and another might not be. So it's good to catch different teachers' um, attitudes and, and what they think about things. It's, uh, I think it's really good for people to go to others and work with them. So, yeah, I think the same. I, I mean, when we're talking through all of these different schools of playing, this is what I'm thinking about, is that probably there's something good from every one of them. And what is the best from Salcedo? What for you? I mean, what you took the best things? It wasn't technique with Salcedo. It was interpretation. Um, he was a great one for silences, a great one for for 
movement to show silence, movement in silences. Um, I remember in Ravel, his, uh, the Ravel introduction in Allegro, spending a whole lesson just on what to do in the cadenza. And just the motions that he felt that I should make. And of course, it wasn't with Salcedo, you couldn't ever do anything that looked like you were acting. It had to be natural. So he would have an explanation for everything. For instance, there, there would be a hold. Don't move in the hold. Hold, you know, and hold your audience there with you so they don't know what you're going to do next so that they are engaged in what you're doing. Too many people, they just, <laughs> they're moving their hands all the time rather than letting things take their, their course and, and letting the sound go and letting people wait and see what's going to happen. So I would say that Salzado was very good with the silences. He was also, in this day and age, he wouldn't be allowed to do this, but he had a way of kneading your shoulder with his hands when you were playing that helped you to make your phrase the right way. Nowadays, if you did that with one of your, your girl students, they'd have you up against, uh, <laughs> they'd be reporting you for sexual harassment or something. But, but he had, well, no, it's true. People have yeah. to be very careful nowadays. Um, but he was he was very physical in his way of telling whether you were tense or or whatever, and uh, helped a lot with phrasing. Just I I can I can remember certain things that I only got because he was doing this, you know, and it wasn't sexual. I was not one of his girlfriends, in case. <laughs> Well, those those stories are quite quite known, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that was you were right. That was different different time, uh, and uh, of course now it's much more more difficult. I always, especially with the young uh, students, I need to ask the permission to to touch to uh, to change the position or so and so on. But the most important for me now is the arpeggiatos because I'm uh, f now fighting a lot with that, mm, uh, with uh, rolling every chord uh, everywhere. And um, yeah. I remember you was telling me that uh, Salzado himself was rolling quite a lot, especially in his music. But I see yeah. you, the way you play, uh, you uh, rolling really the only the chords which are necessary. So, um, how uh, how what is your opinion about the arpeggiatos and how to choose where it's not written but composer was thinking about it and where it's not written just because composer wanted to cycle so what is your opinion on that that's a very good question um my opinion you see i come through it from the standpoint of having studied the piano for so many years I mean, the piano, when I was growing up, the piano was the important instrument to me until I decided that it was going to be the harp. Um, and, and it's interesting because Salzado also was one of, he was a fantastic pianist, a really amazing pianist. Um, so it's, it's interesting to me that he did roll so much, but it wasn't just him. I think it's, I think rolling chords is a sort of a French way of playing the harp. And I think a lot of French people, uh, harpists do roll a lot. Um, and I think most of them now are saying, well, it's not necessary to roll that many chords. Um, and certainly there are some that would sound better if you didn't. However, it's very hard to get a good sound on an unrolled chord on a straight chord unless you have a really good technique and unless you can absolutely have all of your fingers working equally in that chord. And I think a lot of people roll just because they, they'll get more of the harmony of the chord out because they're rolling and mm -hmm. it won't sound so, it won't sound so um, uh, dry. The chords, 
sometimes sound very dry because the third and the second finger aren't working when they're playing them flat. However, I mean, with my students, I teach them how to really make the, the third and the second finger work. And that's because I, I teach them, okay, you play nothing on your fourth and nothing on your thumb except to move them and really play very loud on your third and your second. And then try this chord and it's amazing. A couple of times and you, full, you, heal, you hear the full chord. Um, where to roll and where not to roll? Well, I know in Salcedo's Variations, I know that you and I had a talk, we were talking about this driving in the car to go to um, the Glenn Gould School, I think, for a master class. And you were saying that you did not like to roll the first, the chords in the variations. And I agree, it sounds really good when you don't, uh, much more classical, but he always had you roll them. So I always roll them when I play it because it's straight from his mouth. That's what he wanted. Um, there are, Salzado did mark with um, one of those little brackets, chords that he didn't want rolled. And in many of his pieces, uh, they're well marked out that he didn't want them rolled. Uh, for instance, um, one of the pieces I studied with him when I was really, really young and did not understand and did not like was Lamentation uh, in his preludes. And in Lamentation, he has lines and lines and lines of chords that are bracketed not to be rolled. And then what's really funny is that at some point <clears throat> in his life, he went through them and marked out all the lines all the brackets as though he wanted them not to be rolled anymore. I mean, to be rolled <laughs> and it sounds horrible. The way he first envisioned that piece is so much better unrolled, you know, just straight. And um, yeah, I was teaching it. If Christina is still there, I don't know, but um, uh, I was teaching it to her and she played it so great that she inspired me, now I'm learning it. <laughs> so, you know, from the time when I was little and couldn't understand it and didn't like it, now I love it. And, uh, but I'm playing it the way he originally wrote it. But anyway, that's rolled chords or something, but being a pianist, I think, how would this sound if it weren't rolled on the piano? And then I make my decision that way. Exactly. That's that was the main topic. Also, when when I spoke with Isabel Peran or with Yana Boshkova, everything comes to the piano. So, like, uh, if yeah. you play the piano, you understand the music better somehow, and it's yeah. true. Really, it's it's better taste, I think. And then you can hear the harp in different way, and it helps a lot. So, but I know that you, there is much more difficult uh, things than just rolling uh, the chords uh, in your uh, work with the composers. I mean, there were, there were a lot of composers like Robert Turner, John Weinswein, uh, Glenn Boer, and of course, uh, Mira Schaefer. And um, there is some more, I think, Harry Zomers. Or so. And so there is a lot of Canadian composers which were writing the music for you, and you was recording that. So when when it when it started, and uh, um, where this music is now, and uh, I know that it's on on very different in a lot of different cities. But what was the the way of working with composers, and how how you met them all? 
Well, um, I think you mentioned Robert Turner. Do, have you yeah. heard that piece? Unfortunately not. That, that I don't have. Yeah. Uh, it was a piece I didn't like very well, but I never really, I never really worked with him. The CBC just commissioned him to write this piece for me. And I didn't like it that much. I, I, it was commissioned by the CBC, so I had to record it mm -hmm. and play it on the radio. Um, but I've never heard it since I haven't even heard my recording of it. I, I don't know if there's a recording of it or I think there was, is a recording of it someplace, but I've never heard it. I wasn't that, no, I wasn't that knocked out with it for some mm -hmm. reason or other. And then, um, so that's Robert Turner. I can't tell you anything about him. What was your question? <laughs> well, that, was, that was quite a long question. Not about the uh, different composers because there is a huge list of them, but uh, most importantly, because that's what uh, actually the harpists nowadays should do. I mean, motivate the composers to compose, work with them and uh, create a new music. And uh, you did that wonderfully well. You recorded a lot of uh, music committed, written for you. So how how it happened and what was the process of working with composers? Well, that's, I, yeah, after Robert Turner, I did work with every composer that wrote for the harp. Um, I remember John Winswig was probably the, the next person that I worked with, also a CBC um, and um, Ontario Arts Council uh, Commission. Um, and he was so keen on getting it right that he actually came and took harp lessons from me. And, uh, he was a wonderful man, honestly. Um, I, I really enjoyed teaching him and he, he was so enthusiastic about the harp and wanted to know about all the different things he could do with it, all the different sounds he could make. And, uh, so the first thing he wrote was a concerto for harp and, uh, chamber uh group and it was very dry very dry and sort of 12 tone -ish and and um it didn't i mean i actually recorded it and it is a very good piece but it didn't go very far <laughs> then the second thing he did um the this i think i commissioned him to do this, the second piece, I said, how about writing just a piece now for harp alone with, with nobody else? And um, so he already knew about it. We talked about different ideas to go in the piece and then he went home and wrote it. And I was very busy. I had, by this time I had four kids. And um, so I, I was pretty busy at home and with the orchestra and, not much time to keep track of what's going on in the other part of my life. And so there were several months and then John called me and said, I have some stuff for you. Would you like to hear it? And I said, Oh, in a couple of months, it'd be fine. You know, just take your time. And the next time he said, well, I've written 15 pieces. So if you don't mind, we should look at them. <laughs> and he had done a fantastic job, really. They're all very, uh, they're all there. I didn't work with him at all, except when I had given him those lessons and everything he wrote worked. So then uh, with Schaefer, I had a, I had had a conversation with Takamitsu. Um, <laughs> Takamitsu had been talking, and Takamitsu used to come to Toronto quite a bit. And I did a lot of, not just his orchestral things, but many of the chamber pieces that he wrote and we were talking one time and he said I've always thought that I'd love to write a piece for harp that uh, incorporated bells and that sort of thing that the harpist would wear while they're playing and uh, I thought oh that's a really neat idea but I never heard anything from Takamitsu but we were doing um, a re uh, <clears throat> sort of like a project with with Shaver because most of his <clears throat> sorry most of his compositions um, start out as projects projects historical projects um, 
uh, projects that come from myths and that sort of thing as well. And this one was something called Lustro, and it incorporated the whole orchestra in a very in a round building. And the orchestra was set in four different places, and the singer was in the center, and everything was sort of stereophonic. And the sonorities of the music were absolutely wonderful. And of course, it was also because of Schaefer, it was very theatrical as well, the piece. And during rehearsals, and the funny thing is that Shaver did not write well for the harp at all. The harp part was nothing, but I'm sitting there listening to all this stuff going on around me, all the sonorities. And I finally went up to him and I said, it was my introduction to him actually, I said, you know, you don't write very well for the harp, but I wish you would. And I'm thinking I would love to um, have you uh, commission you get a, see if I can get a Canada Consul grant to commission you to write for the harp. And uh, he said, oh, that's interesting. And he said, and then he made this little excuse. He said, you know, I don't do all my orchestration. I have people that write things in here for me sometimes. <laughs> and I said, well, they didn't do a good job. Anyway, um, the, I, I brought up and I said, you know, the way you use percussion and everything, I'm thinking it would be great. I said, I had this conversation with Takamitsu. This is this brings Takamitsu back in. And um, I said, I had this conversation with Takamitsu in which he talked about um, the harp, harpist wearing bells as they're playing so that, and it, Takamitsu had thought it would be in the arms and uh, wearing bells as they're playing and they would intermittently uh, react to what the harpist is doing. So Schaefer got all interested at that and he said, okay, I'll try something. And I was able to get um, a commission for him to do it. And he came back about three months later and he came, he said, I need to see you. I have some, I have some real great ideas and the pieces ready to be put down on paper now and I have a few things on paper could I bring it over to you and he brought brought it over and it wasn't just the paper it was there were, there was a bongo there was a bell tree there were bells there were all sorts of things and he said now this is what we're going to use here this is what we're going to use there and that's how Crown of Ariadne was written and he said, I, he said, I tried, I got into the harp room at the, at the U of T and he said, I tried the bells and they kept hitting the soundboard of the harp. So that's not going to work. So I put them on your ankles. So, uh, <laughs> and that was how it was written. And, um, as far as working with him, uh, the dance of the bowl, he had written, probably you could play it the way he wrote it. I, I wasn't able to, he had written, um, octaves in both hands as you know like you would do on the piano all over and I said you know this is going to be impossible so I wrote it out the way I thought it would be possible um, I don't know if you've seen the the uh, crown of Ariadne uh, if you've seen the dance of the bull but I made it possible for me and most of the harpists that I know who would be able to play it that way. Um, and uh, so that was one of the things I worked with him with. Uh, most of the things, uh, for instance, Ariadne's dance was perfectly possible everything he wrote. Uh, I fingered it, but uh, it was possible. And um, everything else was possible. <clears throat> um, I, other things that he has written since The Crown of Ariadne needed no real editing from me at all. So everything right there, it worked because of what he got from writing Crown of Ariadne. I, I'm trying to think, oh, there was one thing. he In The Crown of Ariadne, there was... Um, there are two pieces in The Crown of Ariadne that can be played without... You can take it, and you can travel with it, and you don't need to carry a bunch of instruments. One is Dance of the Bull, only needs a finger uh, thing, and uh, uh, that's it. 
and mm -hmm. the uh, Ariadne stance only needs the bongos. So I was thinking, that's two pieces. I would like to play some parts of Crown of, of Ariadne when I go someplace to perform. So I asked him to write one piece without anything. And that is, that's uh, Ariadne's Dream, which is in the new, I think it's in the new uh, music. Yes, 2016. And I didn't have to do a thing with that. There was one place where there was a really, really tough um, pedal change. And I practiced really hard on it and I was able to get it eight out of 10 times, but to me, eight out of 10 times isn't good enough. And I changed one note, got rid of that pedal. And he took it. He said, of course. He said, that, that note doesn't make any difference. It's still in the chord. It's still in the harmony. And got rid of the, you know, got rid of the pedal. So it's the only thing I had to do in that whole piece, uh, that one piece that he wrote. And there is Harry Summers as well. Oh, Summers, that piece was written not for me. It was written, oh. for, um, was written for Edna Phillips, who mm. never formed it and oh. uh, her, yeah, Sam Rosenbaum used to her husband used to uh, practically oh I don't know how many people he commissioned for her and her, the Harry Summers piece was one that was commissioned for Edna to play do you know who El Edna Phillips is because she's way back there she was uh, the principal harpist of the Philadelphia Orchestra before um, before uh, Marilyn Costello you know, I, I, only, I heard this name, there, yes. Yeah, there's only been three harpists in my history. There was Edna, then there was um, um, Marilyn Costello, and now and now there's uh, Elizabeth Hainan. And they're the only ones. I've known them all. <laughs> so The idea is to first to inspire a composer and then also to find uh, the way he will be paid for that piece so or through the foundations or through the um like um private investors there should be some kind of uh, first of all motivation and second the money basis to create the composition and then you just uh, keep working with him and, and uh, trying to understand if uh, everything works well for the instrument now we need new pieces and the people, uh, uh, I think it's interesting for the harpist to know uh, how, to, how to communicate with composers and how to motivate, uh, motivate them because it's, it's, it's a now very important. But I, I must say, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And as you can see, I've agreed with you my whole life because that's one of the things that I have really tried to do. And uh, most of my uh, com my colleagues feel the same way. Uh, but I also think it's really important that we encourage harpists like yourself, who are great harpists to compose for the instrument if they have that talent. I have one student right now who is such, I want her, she's graduated uh, from both harp and piano, and I want her now to do composition because she is such a wonderful, talented composer and she, an improviser. She can, she's really great. I hope she, she continues. And there are so many wonderful harpist composers like Tournier, Salcedo, Renier, all of whom would be household names if it weren't for the fact that the harp is not the big popular uh, solo instrument the way the piano or the violin is. All of them are wonderful composers and we do need to keep playing those harpist composers, the ones in our history and the ones that are coming up now. I'm just learning Caroline Lizotte's Madon, mm -hmm. which I love, La Madon, and um, it's a beautiful piece. Uh, she's a um, French-Canadian harpist. You may have heard of her because her Sweet Galactique, you may have heard that. Uh, I don't know, but fantastic piece. Um, but I'm learning another one uh, by her. And yeah, I think it's really important that we encourage our present-day harpist composers to keep writing, so. 
I remember now the Galactic. Yes, we were sitting in a jury in on the Grand Journey competition in Indianapolis, and uh, their people were performing that suite. That was uh, quite a long time ago, but yeah, well, yeah. I, I have the feeling that, uh, I mean, playing I Love, I know that you have so many favorites from the harpist composers, and I love to play uh, also harp, uh, harp music written by harpists, but why, why I mentioned that uh, it's important to have the also composers, modern composers to write for the harp, because I think this is a part of the problem that uh, we know who are the Renier, the Renier, uh, Salcedo, uh, but the rest of the world doesn't know. And uh, if we put those composers with other known composers, which uh, were writing for the harp, then it's possible to make a balance and then show that the quality of the music is also on the same level, even the composer was the harpist himself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you full heartedly. And, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you just uh, a single question because uh, there is there are a lot of CDs you recorded. There is a full list of them. And uh, what is important for me that every CD is uh, so well planned. I mean, the program for each CD is made with so much love and understanding of what you're doing. So can you give some recommendations how to create the set, how to create the program for the CD and not just playing what, whatever you have in hands? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> well, that looks like this. <laughs> I think whenever I've done a CD, I've just done what I wanted to work on at the time. Actually, I'm doing a CD right now. Mm -hmm. And now let's, my caveat is that I'm 83. I'm going to be 84 very soon. I don't have the time or the energy to practice as much as I used to. So I'm doing everything one thing at a time. But my CD this time is things that I have never done, never recorded, or like that I, things that I have never recorded or always wanted to work on. So that's my project. And so I'm doing the Tournier Second Sonatine, which I've always wanted to play and never had the time to practice. But if you're only doing one thing, you can practice on it until you learn it, and then you can record it. And I did that. And uh, Renier, Ballad Saint Fantastique, I, and all of these things I do perform before I record them as well a couple of times. The Ballad Fantastique, I put that on a program, and, and uh, Renier, um, and performed it for my 80th birthday. And so then I recorded it. So, and... Uh, so I've done that and the uh, the Tournier second sonatine, and then I never recorded the ending of Salzedo's variations, the um, starting with the Barcarolle, and I feel they should be recorded, and I'm not sure if anybody has, so I recorded that, and now I am doing um, La Madame by um, Caroline Lizotte, mm -hmm. and. Um, Lamentation, because I was all inspired by my student who played it so well to learn it myself. And uh, Julie K. Jameson's uh, arrangement of Piazzolla Oblivion, and I'll record that, and then the recording will be done. So it's all having to do with harpist composers or a harpist arrangement in the, in the case of Julie K. Um, and that, I don't know, I think they all sort of go well together. The Oblivion and Lamentation and Madame go really well together. The three of them, one right, a, right after the other, is fantastic. Um, but I, I never really, like I said, I only recorded what was interesting for, for me to be working on at the time. And so maybe those things, because they were my interest, maybe if they actually did seem well put together, I'm glad they did, but I wasn't aiming for that. <laughs>
well, I think you just have a very good taste. And um, well, I'm a, I'm I'm big fan of very different things. Uh, also, the modern things uh, you do and uh, of Hindi meat sonata. I think this is the best interpretation I I ever heard. I mean, the best for me. I like that a lot because it's yeah. all very dry, strict, uh, rhythmical, without this rolled chords everywhere. So it's uh, beautiful. But also the way you work with the students. I mean, when I came to Toronto, I didn't see just the class. I saw the family, like uh, uh, people who are so much inspired by each other and they have so much trust. So uh, I, I was always very curious. Uh, is it just like your personality or you have something in the head which you want to create? I mean, you all, all always want it. I mean, the way you work with the students. Um, well, I always feel that there's something in each one of my students that has to come out. So I do give them suggestions, but I have learned over the years that very often they will do something, they will know that there, something needs to be done there, but they won't necessarily do what I suggest because they feel things differently from me. And I think that's a really, really important thing for all teachers to know you cannot make um, copies out of people. You have to bring out what's within the people themselves and um, hope that they are able to bring out what's within them. I mean, every one of my harpist students are such great people and they have a lot to offer personally and in, in their music. And I, I, I really respect them all. And that's what I hope to see them to bring out in themselves. And it takes time because being a musician, you grow up. <laughs> I mean, everybody has to grow up. I feel like I'm still growing. I'm still becoming the person I could be, maybe, someday. And, uh, yeah, I feel life is a continuating, a continuing thing from womb to tomb sort of thing, and that we never stop, and that we never stop trying to be the best that we can. And that's what I try to bring out of my students. That's very inspiring. I mean, that's, that's absolutely amazing. I, you know, uh, I, I really hope that also with this situation, when we have now this time to a little bit re reconstruct, rethink our life, we will have enough inspiration, enough power to do something for the future. And especially when we hear that from you, because you, you, after so many uh, different things after so huge experience you always look forward I mean and you uh, every every interview I was reading now you you are saying about the plans like for eternity and you that's why I think you you don't even like to speak about the past so much because there is so much so many inspiring things in the future so uh, for sure <laughs> Next one will well, be in July, yes? The concert. I'm sorry, what? The concert will be in July online, yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, July 7th at 3 o'clock. <laughs> July 7th, 3 o'clock. That's yeah. very good. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very happy that we had this possibility. And um, I hope people, people were also uh, watching us on the Facebook. So... Uh, well, it was, it was really great to see you again, I have to say. And I do enjoy everything you do. I, well, I, I think that you, you are totally right about the inspiration, that when we are inspiration for each other, this is the best thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. It was great talking to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you really. How do I get out of here? <laughs> I need to close it. I mean. Okay. But, yeah. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you for Bye. asking me. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.